Good morning, all. How are you? Seems like a, a lively group, so <laughs> thank you very much. Um, once again, if you have any trouble hearing me, please let me know. I can. I used to, you know, have a joke about being a professor from New York, but <laughs> not anymore. <laughs> so, now I'm a professor from South Carolina, which is actually delightful. So I started in July, so I was here for the heat, so you don't have to warn me. You could have, a little earlier, could have warned me. Um, and, but now I've managed to live through tropical storms, hurricanes, and snow flurries. It's a lovely, <laughs> lovely thing going on. Um, so, we've got about two hours to spend together. And trust me, it's not me talking at you for two hours. So I love the fact that we're in movable configuration space. Uh, but what I wanted to do today is talk a little bit about, well, let's see what we're going to talk about. I want to talk a little bit about what is a library. And you're going to sit there and go, but Dave, we know we're here. We have a paycheck. It's lovely. Um, but when we talk about things like Lego robotics and robotics kits and suddenly maker spaces and 3D printers and audio collections and DVDs and online services, it may be a little bit harder to answer than it used to be. And it's important that we have a nice solid answer because when we go out and ask for resources or for participation or inclusion or knowing our customers and things of that nature, it's good for us to spend a little bit of time reframing. And I'm going to argue that we've done a very poor job, particularly in library science education, of actually answering this question because I think we do it backwards. Then we'll talk a little bit about the true collection of the library. We'll talk a little bit about collection development as it works on that way and finally new skills that we need to get out of this system. And that should take us the morning. But I'm going to begin, if I may, with the problems of definition and why I want to start with what is a library. This is, because we have dictionaries, so we should use them, this is what the Oxford English Dictionary tells us. And they're from Oxford, which means they have English accents, which means they're always right. So, <laughs> a building or room containing collections of books, periodicals, and sometimes, Films and recorded music for people to read, borrow, or refer to. Or simply a collection of books and periodicals held in a library. Or a collection of films, recorded music, generic, genetic material, etc. Organized systematically, kept for research and borrowing, series of books, room in a private house. This really feels like it's a good answer. Right? If I said, what's a library? Actually, what's a library? I know it's a trick question, but I promise it's all right. It's a place where people can come and check out books and borrow information. All right. To learn. Very good. What's a library, I mean? Yeah. <coughs> it's a collection of materials that you learn, you can learn from. Okay. Not necessarily just books. Good. Great. Right. Thank you. What's a library? <laughs> <laughs> I know you're the IT guy, but it's all right. <laughs> yeah, my, my, my definition is more of that last one. Mine, you know, the, uh, Available software? Yeah. <laughs> so, all right, this is great. Then we've got no problem because we know <clears throat> exactly what a library looks like. Right? It's a place and a collection of books and materials. <laughs> Right? This is, this is the infamous book sale. This is, right? this is where the friends of the library take every material that we try to weed out of a collection and make sure it stays in the library, even though we put price tag on it. Right? We don't necessarily think of this as a library. Right? Well, it's, but it kind of matches a lot of these definitions. So it's not quite enough to say it's a collection of materials, even if it's for learning, even etc. Right? There, there's, the other thing is this, probably don't want to include this one either. Now what's interesting about this picture, and I know in the back it may be a little fuzzy, but if you look at it, it's like this guy has very interesting collections, and then you begin to see there's a lamp, and then there's a desk, and you realize that this is his home, and you suddenly go, oh. <laughs> oh. Right? But because honestly, there's just a really short step from that to this, right? Old joke, what's the difference between a librarian and a pathological hoarder? <laughs> Librarians use canvas bags. <laughs> this is not what we want to include. We don't want to be just a space with stuff. 
And what we can do is we can sit and refine all we want about, well, our stuff's better organized, and we have prettier shelves, and, you know, it's not just books, there's other stuff, too. But, you know, back to my IT friends, because that's where I come from, right? There's a little pathological wording that occurs to it, and we have mice from 1932. Right? <laughs> and I, usually, literally, the scampering time. But I was going through my bag. I, I, I have the original Apple Newton. I mean, even people who did the Newton don't want that anymore, but I've got one. And, you know, oh, we never know when this adapter is going to be useful because the Commodore 64 will come back. And, <laughs> so a collection of stuff, even if we specify the notion of books, even if we specify materials, the problem with that definition, which seems nice and concrete, when you begin to break at it, when you begin to wear at it, begins to break down. Now, I, want, I bring this up for a couple of reasons. This is really important when we talk about and I'm just going to continue to pick on your wonderful children's library, if I may, for a moment. When we begin to talk about, well, now we've got robotics kits. Now we've got Makey Makey. Now we've got the <coughs> idea of 3D printing. Now we've got DVD collections coming in. Some people with that definition from the Oxford Institution thought they've got it. Suddenly go, wait a minute. That's not a library. And what's interesting is when we begin to talk about this, that definition begins to limit where we can go. So a uh, fellow by the name of John Palfrey. John Palfrey was a law librarian at, at Harvard. He's now the headmaster of a uh, prep school in, in Massachusetts. And he wrote a great book called Bibliotech. And he talks about the dangers of nostalgia. And the dangers, you know, we think of nostalgia as this sort of warm, fuzzy feeling. But it ultimately can also be a trap where your image, your set concrete, very positive picture of an institution or thing was set early on, and it limits you from seeing how it evolves. And so the notion that when people think of a library, they think, oh, I love a library. <laughs> When's the last time you were there? 32 years ago. <laughs> What'd you love about it? <gasps> the smell of books. <laughs> you realize that's a fungus. <laughs> The smell of the mahogany wood. It's like, you know, you're like, that's mold. No, it's, you know, this idea that when we talk about how do we advance, how do we move forward, what else can we do, how can we serve folks, sometimes it's that nostalgia that gets in the way. Richland County Public Library, as you may know, is busy going through rehabs and refurbishes of all their buildings, etc. They put a nice little piece in the paper, and Melly Huggins was there as the director, and she said what we, you would think is one of the least controversial statements ever. The library is about people. I mean, the library is about people. Exactly at what point do you go, no, I hate people. <laughs> right? And But sure enough, online, the trolls come, and there's an open box. They're going to post something. Wrong, Melanie. The library is about books. Right? Now, there's an interesting thing with that. This idea of books, I do this on a regular basis, by the way. I teach undergraduates, and so I have people from criminal justice, and I have people from public health. So I have people across the spectrum, and we play this game. Give me one word that you think about with libraries. Books, books. Books, 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 really books, 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 books. Actually, what I got was really comfy couches. <laughs> but here's the trick. So I want you to think, all right, library, book. Let's just, I'm just going to give you that. But here's what we're going to do, and yes, back to class participation. I want you to give me one word you associate with books. Okay? I'm going to pick on folks with that. <laughs> Literacy. This is word association. You're supposed to go with it, and it's your mother. I won't tell you. Go. Word. Fun. Fun. Information. Reading. Reading. Enjoyment. Enjoyment. Adventure. Adventure. Learning. Learning. When we try and collapse things into nice, simple, easy, precise definitions, we begin to lose some fidelity. It doesn't bother me that people associate things with books because books often have these magical associations from reading and words and paper to escape and adventure and learn. That's the idea we have to begin to break down. So the problem with defining the institution by sort of its physical attributes is not only do we 
begin to associate things we don't want to be associated with, but we begin to miss things that we do want to be associated with. This is a library. This is a library. Uh, this is the Onondaga Community Library up in Syracuse, New York. And this is what it loans out. Body parts. I know, isn't it? <laughs> Good news, they're plastic. Except, let's see, somewhere in here, I've got to be careful. Where is it? Where? Oh, I know you, can, you can't even see it. That's a dissected cat. Oh, my God. It's like in plastic. I know. I'm not a cat person, so I'm not bothered by that. <laughs> I'll be honest, someone's a bit of a celebration for me, but, um, because, <laughs> well, cats are just there to wait for you to kill you. That's, they want your soul. Anyway, <laughs> I know, half the audience is walking out now. All right. <laughs> no, my point is, why in the heck are they loaning out potty parts? Is this, like, a grim fascination of a librarian? Any guesses? It's on by a community library. It's a, on, it's a community college. Exactly. Well, the science teachers, they, have, they teach anatomy, they teach pre nursing right? It makes sense, right? This idea that learning doesn't just occur from books and materials, it occurs from in anatomy classes, etc. We see this all the time. Different kinds of libraries. Now, we want to look at this and go, but that's not a book and sometimes recorded music. But we obviously want to keep that in the list. How about this one? This is the human library called the Prejudice Library. There, you've probably seen many of these events. Maybe you've had a human library event here. Uh, this is in Europe. And the idea is they went through European libraries, and the idea was a prejudice library. You can check out a Muslim. You can check out a Jew. You can check out a black. You can check out a black. Any people that you don't regularly meet, this gave you the chance to begin to encounter another situation in a safe Civil environment. We see this happen a lot with the idea of being able to check out a policeman, check out a fireman, check out a, an accountant, check out a professor, check out what have you. Back to that Onondaga Community College, once a year they have a human library. You can check out the president of the college. And so students can walk in and for 15 minutes have a sit-down conversation with the president of the college. Where are we going? What's the priority? I've seen mayors that participate in this. Counselors participate in this. So this is the idea that, once again, collecting materials for learning, connecting people, doesn't fit into, well, like, is that kind of recorded music? Right. And so this isn't necessarily fit this definition, but we want it to fit this definition. We want to be able to be a place of learning. We want to be a place of engagement. A library should be a safe place to encounter dangerous ideas. Think about that for a moment. A library should be. I'm not going to say it is, because that takes work and takes effort. We love to think that our libraries are inclusive and safe for all. But are they? Do we, work, do we ever spend time with people who don't come into a library to realize why it isn't? And sometimes, oh, they don't know about it. If only they knew about it. I've got to kill this argument real quick. If only they walked into the building, they would realize that they had been missing us their entire life. Right? It's like the worst sort of comment you make to yourself on Valentine's Day alone. If only they would date me, they would understand I'm perfect in every way. <laughs> this idea that, once again, nostalgia is preventing them. They don't understand what's happening. But are they staying away because they don't feel welcome? They don't see themselves in the collection. They don't necessarily see themselves behind the desk. Are they staying away because they can't get here? I'm going to talk a little bit later about a library in uh, Kansas. And they came up with a community impact study. They wanted to talk about what their community wanted. They worked with the United Way, the library. And they said, what our community needs is readiness for kindergarten. <clears throat> because we know in basic literacy <clears throat> that if kids don't read at grade level, by the time they're third grade, the odds that they will drop out of high school go up dramatically. <clears throat> and we know that when one drops out of high school, the odds of high-paying positions, incarceration, all these things also jump up. And so they came out and they said, we want readiness by kindergarten. And they looked around. They had, by the way, it was a city library, but they had one building. They didn't have branches. And they looked and said, all right, we're, we're doing well with the people who walk in this building. They are ready. Their kids are ready. They bring in the story time. They bring in the reading. They have that connection. They have enthusiasm. 
What areas aren't coming to the library? What areas have generally bad statistics of preparation for kindergarten? And they found underserved populations, and they said, oh, that's great. We'll handle this region. Let's do it. And you know what the thing that kept them from actually serving that community was? Guesses? Transportation. No buses. So here was a community that was physically isolated, not only from the library resources they wanted to get, but from job opportunities, from participation in civic environment, whole things, and it didn't come down to a desire and willingness on the library's part. They wanted to be there. It came down to, are there buses? Can they get to the library? Can the librarian get to them? Or can they go over? Why do we have bookmobiles? Because we need a spring drive every so often? No. <laughs> in, in, uh, in Europe, once again, in the Netherlands, the Frisk Lab, they wanted to talk about maker spaces in 3D. And what they did was they found a bookmobile. They pulled up books and shelves, and they put in 3D printers, and they put in laser etchers, and they put in computers, and they put in coding camp. And they would drive from school to school to school to make sure that even places that didn't have physical access to a library could get to these resources and learning and connections. Right? I mean, everything that's old is new again. So how do we begin to incorporate that? In fact, here's an example of a library from Kenya. So in Kenya, they're building libraries as fast as they can. They love public libraries and build them everywhere. Where they can't get good enough roads or infrastructures, or when they get out into some of the villages, they actually have donkey carts where they pull materials into those communities on a regular basis. Where even the donkeys can't go, particularly up in the northern desert regions of Kenya, what they've done is they've attached them to camels. And so, on a regular basis, the camels come in with a librarian, these boxes get open, they set up tents, they set up materials, and they sit with parents and children and talk about literacy and reading and the importance of reading, reading literacy. Now, the camel in Kenya is a very special beast. It's the most important asset that most of these organizations, that most of these villagers own. It's labor, being able to move and, and take things out. It's transportation. It's fertilizer. It's actually fuel. They actually take the dung and they dry it out and they burn it. Not a happy idea, but it gives them fuel. And when it dies, sorry, I know I have a theme going here, <laughs> it's meat. So, now they look at it as an essential animal because it's also learning and knowledge. So does this a library? Yeah. So we want to include that as well. So the problem with the definitions that we run into is this doesn't quite get it. And the problem that this has <laughs> is that it's defined the wrong way. How many people are librarians here? Let me give you a good definition of a librarian for a moment. If you are hit by a bus in the morning and you're not able to open the library, you count as a librarian. How many librarians do we have here? <laughs> My point of this is, for a long time, what we have defined a librarian to be is someone who works in a library. But if you push on that definition hard enough, it breaks down. So as a professional, a paraprofessional, a staff member, what have you, the idea that you are a librarian or you are a library worker if you work in a building or a room that contains materials. Notice, by the way, once again to my bookmobile person, nowhere does it mention diesel engines. <laughs> so you're out. The idea is that for too long, we've assumed that the building, the collections, the materials, that this is the value, and the people within it are sort of there to extract the value and work with the community. It doesn't work that way. Because if we continue to find it this way, it's the building, the materials, and this definition, the stuff and the things that define what we do, not our ultimate goal and mission and what we want to accomplish. So we need to turn it around. We need to take a look at defining the library not by its attributes, its physical attributes, or even its functions, because we know those functions change. Wayne Wigan, if you haven't read, he wrote a fabulous book on the history of public libraries in America. Fabulous. For example, 
Does anyone know what social movement spawned the public libraries in America? A history lesson. I'll get that later. Well, the main Franklin stuff after the Good question. Benjamin Franklin. Many people attribute, uh, attribute Benjamin Franklin for the first public library. He did not. He created what's called a subscription library in Philadelphia. What that meant was he ran out of room for all his books. And he had a bunch of friends who ran out of room for all their books. And so they rented the space and combined them. But in order to utilize it, you had to pay. You had to become a subscriber to the library. The first public library was probably in Massachusetts, but you know, we don't like to let the Bostonians know because they're already copying them. But the first public library in Philadelphia was not Benjamin Franklin's subscription library. It was the Free Library of Philadelphia that got its name free because it was free to use to all people. It was formed by, and I'm not making this up, a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. His name was Dr. Pepper. <laughs> really? Look it up. Dr. Pepper. I don't think it had anything to do with the soda, but wouldn't that be hilarious? He got a bunch of money from his uncle, the other Dr. Pepper, and opened up the free library because he was worried about access to all democratic participation and things of that nature. All right. The, the question, what did I just ask? What was it? Oh, it grew out of the same social movement that gave us public education. It was the same movement that said, we need to get our kids out of factories and into schools. I, it, it, we invented childhood. I want to be really clear here. Childhood, as we currently think about it, precious, obnoxious, whatever you think of children, was invented as a concept in the early 1800s, because we suddenly said they're not little workers. They're special and should be treated differently by society. They shouldn't just go into factories. They should go into education. And so the public education system grew public schools, that we felt that it was necessary to fund schools, et cetera, it should be on the public goal. All of that came out of it. At the same time, they said, but we're taking the kids out of the factories, and we're giving them an education. What about their parents? What about the other factory workers? What about the other laborers? They need a place to learn, too. And as M Melville Dewey said, the public library is a co-equal educational institution to the public school. Co-equal. And so this idea of what a library was, a public library in the U.S., is very unique. It's a very unique U.S. concept. There have been libraries and public libraries, and libraries funded by public dollars for centuries and centuries and centuries. If you go over to Italy and you say, where's the public library? They, what they'll do is they'll say, well, there's one over there. And what they mean is public funds fund that library. It doesn't mean pu the public actually has access to the library. Here, the concept of free to all, the embedding to the dem democratic process, is a uniquely American invention that has found its way in cross cultures. But it started as an educational institution. It didn't start as, boy, we've got a bunch of books. What do we do with them? That was Benjamin Franklin's problem. But the notion of a public library from Dr. Pepper forward was that people should be able to learn on their own time. So Wayne Wigan writes this story. Wayne Wigan says, in the turn from the 18th to the 19th century, public libraries had a problem. Public libraries were providing and distributing materials that at the time had the same sort of connotation as pornography today. There was this huge debate because libraries were starting to stock a certain type of information. And people were doing that's not what a, that's not what a public library should be. Anyone want to guess what the pornography of the day was? Novels. Literary novels. Today, if we talk about the love of reading and giving out youth fiction and whatever, we go, yay, we're winning. At the time, they were writing op-eds in, in newspapers that said, this will only distract women and farmhouse boys to think greater and above their station. It's only for a certain ladies of the night, and for some reason bartenders should, are the ones who care about literary novels. We were distorting and terrifying and warping our communities because we were kind of carrying fiction. What I tell you about that is, our idea of a library has evolved over time. What does it do? What does it fit? What does it provide? How does it provide it? And it didn't happen naturally. It didn't happen as a course. It happened through activism. It happened through dedication. It happened through strategy. 
It happened through people having conversations with their communities going, this is what we need now. All of these read posters sitting up here are not a natural consequence of having a public library. All of these read posters are a direct consequence of librarians talking to their community saying, you need this. Not just what do you want, but what do you need? So the people in this building define what a library is. The library comes from you, not the other way around. So what we need to talk about is, what's a librarian? So first, I'm going to, once again, this is a big tent conversation. Because I know some of you are sitting there going, well, it's not me because I don't have the key to the executive bar. <laughs> it's not me because I'm not invited to all the cool librarian parties because I'm only a. We need, <laughs> yeah, I know, cool librarian parties. I think that's the part she's laughing at. <laughs> we have to get over this notion that librarians are these amazing specific way of getting. There are three ways of becoming a librarian. One, you get an education. I have a library science school. I think that's the preferred way because I get money from it. And so if you're interested in becoming a librarian, talk to me afterwards. We'll get you there. But it's one way. The other way we have to be acknowledged is that you can become a librarian because you're hired as a librarian. A huge percentage of the libraries in this country are in rural settings, and most of them are manned not with ALA accredited Masters of Library Science librarians, but by people who were hired and said, you're the librarian. In New York, where we have good laws, like South Carolina, about what requirements and regulations, we had someone who was a librarian, and her job was to get up in the morning to clear the sidewalk in front of the library, and then to run the library, and then in the afternoon, she would go run the post office. But once again, she gets hit by a bus, particularly when it's scraping her off the sidewalks. The library is closed. She's a librarian. The third way, which I think is the most interesting way, is librarian by spirit. That is someone who doesn't necessarily have the education or title, but someone who believes in the principles and values of librarianship, who believes in the service and what we can do. So let me try and give you a definition of what I consider to be a librarian. A librarian to me has three major parts. One, they have a mission. The mission of a librarian is to improve society. Right, we can stop there. We'll get to the rest of it in a second. But our job is to make communities better. We help communities make smarter decisions. Hopefully, we do it in a faster, more efficient way. But we are in the community improvement business. How? Through facilitating knowledge creation, that's a big fancy term, but feel free to throw the word learning in there, in their communities. Because lots of people want to improve our communities. Police want to improve our communities through safety and security. Firemen want to improve our communities through security and safety. Doctors want to do it through health. Right? Politicians want to do it, I'm going to leave that one alone. We have these all, right? We have lots of people that want to make our communities better. We do it through learning. You're about to say, but Dave, we're not the only ones. You're right, we're not the only ones. Museums, schools, lots of people seek to do it through learning. Those are our partners. Those are our strategic assets that we need to network and connect to on a regular basis. We need to be part of those. So our mission is part of what defines us. And when I talk about facilitation, how do we do this? So is a librarian the same as a teacher in a classroom? No. Why? We have different ways of helping learning occur. So how do we do that? We do that through facilitation. What does that mean? Well, we do it through things like access. Right? We have the stuff. Come get the stuff. A lot of, I'm going to continue to pick on you, right? A lot of the robots are sitting here in a library because individual people can't necessarily afford them. Right? It's an asset, and if we can bring together community resources or get grants or what have you, we can provide you access where you couldn't afford on your own. We see that in encyclopedias and dictionaries, online databases, journal databases, whatever it is, we can become a community asset. We can provide you access to stuff. But here's the trick. That, which we think we have nailed, frankly, we do in a very limited way. What I mean by that is, do we provide access to someone? I'm going to pick on a word that I've heard before. 
custom. I hate the phrase custom. I'm sorry to pick on you because I'm sure it took a long time. But, and, and I want to be really clear, I don't care what term you and your community agree to. If it's customer, if it's user, if it's Bob, I don't care. But within our own discussion, we have to be very, very, very careful about our terms. For example, how many people would say that you treat your users well, that you provide your users with service? How many people enjoy being used? <laughs> oh, I could do consumer next. How many people? All right. It's a different relationship. When you go and you buy a car, you want a good car and you want to walk away. You don't want to like have a relationship and an ongoing conversation. You want a car and you want it to work. A library is a different thing. You, we are of the community. They pay taxes. We live in this community. We are literally neighbors. That kind of intimate, complex relationship is not simply, I got good service out of you, I go away. It's a connection that says, how can we do better? How can you be a part of it? Right. So access isn't just to our stuff. It's also access is two ways, from us to them, from them to each other. When people come in, do you guys do have any sort of recording spaces, video or audio recording? You play that game? If someone comes in and says, I want to podcast. I have this idea, I want to podcast. You say, well, good. We have an internet connection, you can get to lots of podcasts. He goes, no, 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 I want to podcast. I want to make my own podcast. Access in the traditional way, there's a computer, you can get to stuff, you can consume the stuff. But do we provide access, not only from the individual to the world, but the world to the individual? Oh. We have a recording studio. We can give you, we can host some space for you. We can put it online. We'll do a training session about how you do this. You have a microphone you can roll out. Suddenly, access makes a lot more sense. Why are we collecting all this stuff? It's not so that you know you can't afford it, it's we collect this stuff so you can produce as well as consume. You can participate and be part of it. But access to what? Just stuff? I think we're talking about access to learning, to knowledge. Knowledge is not in books and materials. I'll give you an example. Give me an example, Dave. I get a book. I give you a book. Is that knowledge? Why not? You can learn from a book, right? Is the book knowledge? When would a book not be knowledge? When you don't open it, right? You can't just hold your hand. Because <laughs> if you could do that, I would have passed French. <laughs> I fell asleep on that book every day. Not to make its way in. How else? What? How else can a book not lead to or be knowledge? Think simple. Can't read. There's one. Right. These collections, these materials, this paragon of area of reading materials and connections to the world is useless to people who can't read. Or it's in Chinese, Mandarin. You don't speak Mandarin. Right? Knowledge is a uniquely human thing. Because the truth is, if you hand someone a, a book, they may get something out of it you had no intention. Oh, my, one of my favorite stories. The historian was talking about, he was studying England and the history of England. And he was going through all of these archives, and he had horrible hay fever. And he was going into these dusty old archives of mold and mildew, and he was driving him nuts. And he's sitting one day at the end of the table, and this other scholar walks to the other end of the table with a bunch of loose documents. And every so often, as the as the scholar is looking through the documents, he would go, "Put it down. Pick up another document. Put it down." This guy with hay fever is going nuts. He's like, "What are you doing?" He says, I'm studying how the Black Plague propagated through the UK. He said, by trying to get it, he goes, can I pull it? <laughs> and the scholar said, well, here's the deal. Just as today, trade was key to these villages. As they got pilgrims, as they got people through, they needed people from outside the village to come through to keep the village going. So, your village gets the Black Plague. People don't want to go there. Your village is in bad shape. So you're writing to your friends and neighbors. You don't start a letter with, 
how's your day going? We have the Black Plague, right? This is not what you, so as you write it, it's not in the documents. Everything's happy and fine, and suddenly we have a lot of real estate available, and you know, et cetera. But what they would do is they take all these lovely letters, they put them in a bag, and they would douse it in vinegar if there was any plague there, and that's what they would then distribute. So the guy trying to trace the history of the Black Plague couldn't, the writing was useless to him because, in fact, it would be the exact opposite. But the, the scent of vinegar on it told him where the plague was. Knowledge can come from objects in all sorts of ways, how we interpret it. In other words, that thing wasn't what he read. It was how it smelled. But even then, the knowledge is this guy understood why it smelled that way. The knowledge was here. So when we talk about access to knowledge, Yes, the books and materials and databases and DVDs and online materials and the robots, those are great. But what about access to the other knowledge that's in your community? What about the access to the engineers who live down the street? What about the access to the historian, to the plumber, to the accountant, to the person who has lived here 98 years and understands the history of that institution better than anyone else? Do we provide that level of access? Do we provide access from our community to our community. We provide knowledge, training. In essence, it's great if I have the book, but if I can't read, we provide tutoring service. It's wonderful if there's a website that tells me about it, but you need to know how to use the web. Right? Does this still happen every Christmas where everyone comes in with a Kindle and says, I don't get it? <laughs> or an iPad, I don't get it? Right? When the Kindle first came out, and by the way, I know that seniors, particularly the demographic over 65, is one of the fastest growing users of technology, but it still lags behind the others. Is that, you know, good son says, oh, mom, you love reading, here's a Kindle. By the way, you need a Wi-Fi network. You, you need to know how to use Amazon. You need a password, right? And so suddenly they're all coming in going, no. So it's not just enough to have access, you also need to know what to do with it when you get it. My IT friends will appreciate this. You wanted a new computer. Here it is. Great. What's this thing on it? Windows 10. What's that? You have access to it, but God knows what, who was thinking when they came up with Windows 10, right? So you have access to it. You know what to do. But do you feel safe doing it? Now, the environment's really important. Back to that, a library should be a safe place to explore dangerous ideas. Physically safe, but also intellectually safe. Do we track people? Do we talk about privacy? Do we share information on a regular basis? Do we broadcast to the world whether you've done something or not? That's where that comes from. It comes from intellectual safety. But environment is also a different way. So Justin Hankey who um, is a director of a library in Pennsylvania these days, but was at the Chattanooga Public Library running their youth services and children's here. Got a 3D printer. And rather than doing what I probably would have done, which is to go into my office, close the door, and hope to God I could figure out how to put it together, he went to right to the middle of the floor, right to a desk in the middle of traffic, set out the box, and started building. And as people would come by and say, what are you doing? You're going to build a 3D printer, want to help? And parents would go by, you know anything about this? Does anyone have a... He said at one point, they had managed to extrude enough plastic around the print head that they had to take a hammer and chisel to get it off. <laughs> now that creates a very interesting environment. If we talk about books and materials and whatever it is for learning, do we demonstrate that learning is important and is full of mistakes? And that's okay. We talked also about the greedy librarian problem. The greedy librarian problem is when you ask a question of a librarian and they refuse to give up until they have an answer. Even if the person that has the answer may be sitting next to them, they will not give up that question. Right? I mean, they could be sitting here. Albert Einstein could have stopped in from the dead to hang out the desk. Someone says, could you tell me about general relativity? They're like, excuse me, Albert, I'll be right back. I'm going to go check with the meeting. Right? This is a greedy librarian problem. When we give our programming, we are scared to death that something will happen to Another story. Anyone know what a bristle plot is? What's a bristle plot? It's a little uh, rotating rotor that you put on top of the head of a toothbrush and it sort of like moves 
<laughs> so back in the day when people had these things called pagers, right, and it would vibrate to tell you that they had, it, it's literally just this little motor on a piece of lead that goes whee! And if you hook it up to a little watch battery and you glue it on top of the toothbrush where you clip off just the bristles, it'll vibrate. And you can race them. And you can... So I'm at, this, I'm at this program and it's got a bunch of six and seven year olds and they're all doing bristle watch. So they're all following the library. Everyone take their toothbrush, take their scissors, clip. Everyone put this on. And they bought the wrong batteries. The reason they found out they bought the wrong batteries is the bristle bot can do this. <laughs> and they get the next one and go. <laughs> and suddenly all of them go. <laughs> suddenly there was like this mat. There were three librarians there. They were in the corner sitting there going, I don't know. Can we find the batteries? Do we have a purchase order? Do we need a purchase order? Do we need the permission? I said, no, we're not. Because their day, their hour long instructional session has just gone kaput. And while they're sitting having this like instant staff development meltdown in the corner, the students are sitting there going, or the, the six and seven year olds going, I got a double A battery. I wonder what happens if we hook it up to a double A battery. Oh, I don't know. Well, we can't do a double A battery in Bristol. Let's just do the toothbrush. And within seconds, duct tape has that appeared out of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> there were nine volts. There were things being pulled out of the back of. of, of Nintendo systems, and they had personal tanks and personal ships. This is a three-year-old, and they're going to blow things up, and they're going at each other. And in this moment, I locked eyes with the librarians, and we looked at what was happening, and we had this epiphany that said, "This is better." What had just happened was that the librarians had lost control, and learning had occurred. Think about that for a moment. In the environments that you build, how safe do you feel? How safe, and I'm not talking physical safety, which is a very important issue, but how safe do you feel to learn? Is it once a day on President's Day with idiots like me? Or do you feel like every day you're able to try it and embrace that's okay? That if you do it in public, the community's not suddenly going to go up. Oh, they didn't know how to take care of my kids. Oh, clearly the library is a sham, close it down. <laughs> so how do we create an environment that's safe? Through our policies, through our procedures, through our physical attributes, etc., but also through the programming and how we model for our community. How can we expect our community to learn and greatly accelerate their learning unless we demonstrate that we are in the same business? And lastly, motivation. Now, motivation is one of those things that public librarians sort of assume. If someone's in my building, they're motivated. And we tell the stories all the time about that child who walks up to us with the book we recommended the week before and glows as they tell how they found their favorite author. This is amazing. They never read before. And in fact, their cancer was cured on Thursday. And they're pretty sure they can fly. Those are great stories. But we also know every so often we get the students who come up, I need this book. Why? Because the school library doesn't have it, and I gotta have this book. Right? We know there are other forms of motivation. But how do we facilitate motivation? How do we build on people's motivation? Right now we assume it. But how do we build it? Same story, same library as the Bristol bots. We're sitting getting a demonstration of different 3D printers. And the librarian there, Lauren Britton, says, well, next weekend, we're going to have a maker fair. People are going to come in, they can use the 3D printer, we're going to have them doing other crafts, and we were going to do, uh, we're going to do duct tape art if I can find anyone who knows duct tape. Everyone knows that duct tape is not just for sticking things anymore. <laughs> duct tape, wedding dresses, wallets, wedding dresses, anyway. Um, Within like milliseconds, my nine-year-old had his phone out and he's going, Well, I've done this and I've done this, and he's a nine-year-old boy. So it's like I've done an axe and a sword and anything destructive, right? And without missing a beat, the librarian said, Great, you're gonna teach it. Back to that glowing child who could fly and their cancer is cured. That was my child as we drove home. That was the best trip in the library ever. Oh my god, I can't believe it. I'm gonna teach this, and I'm thinking about what I do. That motivation is a very specific source that we need to think about, which is co-ownership. When people feel they have ownership of the process, 
when people feel they have a connection, that they have a stake, their motivation goes up. And this is more than once a year when we ask about the tax or the bond measure or what have you. If on a daily basis they think, that's my library, not from the sense of where I go and get service, or where I'm a customer. That's my library. I own it. I help build it. I'm part of it. Its success is partly my success. Changes the relationship dramatically with our community. Good customer service is to make sure they're happy. Good motivation realizes that when they're not happy, that can use, you can use an unhappy moment to engage and accelerate what you do. In other words, to say, I couldn't provide this answer because we didn't have access to that resource. In a customer service, that means you failed. In a co-ownership membership model, it means that you now have a point of advocacy. But we would love to offer that service, but we need tax dollars, we need a greater budget, we need you to talk to the director, we need to, <clears throat> we need to have that type of intimate connection. So, we have a mission to improve society through knowledge creation. How do we do it? Through a series of means of facilitation. But still, that's not enough. The last one is, and we do it based on strong values. What sets us apart from other... Google can very much say they want to improve the world through knowledge. They do. They don't want to be evil. They do it by providing access. They provide training and tools and materials as well. But the values are fundamentally different. And this is the thing that sometimes on a day-to-day -day basis, we get so worried about providing good service that we forget that we have to do values. Our first value is learning. I love, by the way, when I began that idea of what's a library, every one of you said learning. And we learn in lots of different ways. We learn from nonfiction and from fiction. Those literary novels are there not just to entertain, but to help people learn. To discover what they care about, to discover new possibilities, to discover passions, to discover new narratives. Think about that for a moment. What do we learn from nonfiction? What do we learn about ourselves in that process? I'll give you an example. Florence. What do we want people to think about when they think of the PD region? What do we think about with Florence? What's the narrative of this community? What would you say the narrative of your community is? You can give me multiple words. You can give me characters. History. History. Okay? So give me the history narrative. Maybe now go to a sentence. Alright, that's not a sentence. <laughs> it could be your right. Fair. <laughs> history, the railroad and the railroad impacted it. Alright, give me another narrative. What narrative would we want? If, if we were the tourism board, what narrative do we want to get out there? What do we want people to think of when they think of this region? Hospitality. Hospitality. There you go. It's also the halfway, it's also the halfway point between New York and Miami. <laughs> <laughs> Major Iron Five Drugs. <laughs> so what I've heard is convenient and potentially recreational. <laughs> if we lower, if we lower the price on that, a hospitable place, <laughs> and we can put it on railroads. All right. <laughs> now think about that for a moment. <coughs> think about that for a moment. What I just heard was a mix of things that we believe and talk about ourselves, and the other thing is what we think other people are talking about. We don't necessarily want it or keep it, right? That narrative, when you talk about a community, what stories do we share? How do we connect these together, right? How do we build a narrative that people put together? Fiction, right? The idea that South Carolina has a piece of fiction. We have famous authors that write about their history and murders and genteel <laughs> plantations and all these things, right? I was heard a great, great, I mean, I'm new to the area, 
And I heard a great, um, the producer of the Corridor of Shame, a civil rights worker, he was in, I'm, I'm sorry, but I can't name. But he talked about, as he was receiving the award, he talked about how South Carolinians have a lover's quarrel with their history. We have deep problems. I say we. Someday. I, I think I have to actually die and be born and live here three more times before I can say I'm South Carolina. But <laughs> South Carolina took deep pride in history and what the role they played in, in the Revolutionary War. And I mean, I, I dig this stuff, right? I wanted to know why is there a half moon and a palm tree on this flag? Right? And it's not. It's a silver crescent that came from a militia and the palm trees that came from defending and eventually defeating the British during the um, Revolutionary War. I think I have that right. Even the blue of the flag was the major indigo industry that was in the region. But it's also the fact that you couldn't actually build, you couldn't actually grow and export indigo without slavery, because it wasn't economically viable. And talk, he talked about at the end of the Civil War, when they were destitute white and black sitting next to each other, this great opportunity that was not taken. That narrative to a northerner, and by the way, not a northerner in the sense that I pretend that we don't understand racism and have our problems with them, but we have a very different relationship with that. Growing up in, in, in Cincinnati, it was kind of like, well, there was slavery bad, civil war happened, now we need to hire more black people and it's solved. That narrative, that simplistic narrative, does not in any way begin to talk about justice and social structures. But that narrative that he told helped me begin to understand the community I lived in in a very different way. We believe, we use these stories, we use the jokes, we use all of these things as narratives to learn. And fiction is as powerful and sometimes a much more powerful mechanism to understand that than nonfiction. So we're in the learning. And that means we're in the narrative, we're in the storytelling business. Do we help our communities craft a narrative? In other words, probably not in this hospital halfway to mean flat drugs. Can we help our communities create that other narrative? You mentioned railroads. I was in um, the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, they're building a new library. And the library they're building is in a former train factory. Turns out this particular industrial part of the Netherlands was known for building, maintaining train infrastructure. Amazing places. It is now an empty place because that's all moved overseas. And they want the library to go in and rebuild the space. And what the library did was they began, they put up this huge touch monitor. And they began, as people would walk in and they would say, oh, I used to work in this place. They'd go, tell us your story. And they would do an oral history with this person and point out where you worked. And so now anyone walking into this town can press the buttons, hear that story, hear what used to happen there, and understand that railroad tradition and that manufacturing tradition. And it's not a universally happy story, but they began to capture and understand it and tell that narrative in a brand new way. Talking about that, how do we not only give access to people, other people's narratives, how do we provide a venue for our own narratives to share them, to construct them, to think about them? How do we pass those along? If I'm coming to Florence, and I'm going to be here for half a day, do I go to the Florence Public Library to see what's in that community? What can I do there? And you're, yes. Excellent. You go to the South Carolina room, and you just hang out, and you talk to people, and then you learn all about it. Fabulous. Mm -hmm. right. And we do this, we can, this can be as simple as, not simple. This can be as simple as a display of local authors to a South Carolina room to online. Right? But that idea that we're not just, we buy it, we ship it out, you consume it, but how do we come together and learn together? We believe in openness. We believe that in a world of walled gardens, it's important to work across. We believe in this intellectual freedom and safety to do it. We believe in intellectually honesty, not being neutral or unbiased. First of all, realize that the same Latin root for neutral is the same root as neuter. <laughs> Just want to point that one out. <laughs> Think about the people that you trust in the world. Think about whether they have opinions. That connection, that trust, that relationship doesn't come from being neutral. I cannot tell you. You must find it out for yourself. I am a robot. 
It comes from being trusted and knowing what's important and knowing and having that connection and have it consistently come forward. And to say, yes, there are other views of this. There are other ways of looking at it. But we need to be honest in the saying, but we have a perspective on this. All right. So when you put these together, when you put the idea of mission and how we do it and the values that underlie it, that's what makes a librarian. Whether that's a librarian who learned and got all of this in library school, whether that's a librarian who learned and got all this on the job, or whether that's someone who came to it and believes in it and embodies it. Whether that's a page, whether that's the director of the library. We all have to share those values. I've seen again and again where libraries say, oh, we need a IT person. We need a historian. We need a local author. And we put them in that office, and they never talk to anyone else, and it becomes this silo system. As an organization, we need to not only worry about our impact, is, but do we share these values? Do we believe in these values? Do we own these values? And across the board, from janitor to director to board member, how do we understand these things? All right. Now, we can define a library. And then we would do the, begin our interactive portion of the day. A library, then, is a mandated and mediated space. Mandated. You can't just say, I have a library. Here it is. People often talk about how I feel about little free libraries. You guys know little free libraries? Some people are like, isn't that competition? I'm like, God, I hope not. I love the idea of little free libraries. I think libraries should do little free libraries. And in every book that they pull and share and loan should be a nice little thing saying, by the way, need additional, need more help, need other things, here's how to contact us, here's how to be part of it, right? But it's not a mandated space. You guys, and I apologize, my, my public law, my public library law is not what it used to be, in, certainly not in South Carolina. Do you have charters? What legal authority to operate the library? In New York, we charter our libraries, so the state has to, in essence, give you a blessing to do it. But you take taxes. There's a law. There are laws and regulations that tell you what education and background you have to be to say be a director. Right? So mandated means a community had to come to consensus and had to feel a little pain. Whether it's a pain in the pocketbook, a pain in time, the, it's mandated. It's not optional. It's a space, virtual or physical, owned by the community. The community owns this but stewarded by librarians. This is a really strong word. Stewarded does not mean operated by. It doesn't mean manned. It doesn't mean housed. In. It means someone took the time to take care of it, that had a view, had a professional, had an approach, had a perspective. Stewards are people not only of great character, but of great insight. It's a stewarded space. Think about this room for a minute. As this room is currently configured, what do we assume about the learning that occurs in this room? What do we assume about the learning that's occurring in this room? That it's open to everyone. Why do you say that? Okay, look at this. I'm sorry. Very good point. Look at the physical layout, physical structure. What do we say about the learning that we're talking about? It's given. Very binary way. Right. Uh, I, in fact, even get to sit on a stage. Stand on a stage. I'm above you, quite literally. <laughs> what else can we turn by the physical layout of this room? There's a teacher student kind of perspective. Okay, what else? Interactive. Someone interactive because there's at least potential for face to face. Okay? Is it durable? No. Right? I can break this down and move it and change it all I want. Right? Is it meant for a lot of digital work? But is it a computer classroom? No. And it's currently configured. Right? Everything you're sitting at, everything you're looking at, from the candy to the U rock, which I love this, by the way. <laughs> By the way, if I drink this with a full Pepsi, will I die? <laughs> <laughs> Everything in this room is a choice. Everything in this room was a choice. To 
choice of the steward, assumptions, discussion, everything in this room is a choice. And if I walk out into those stacks, if I walk into that building and walk out to your branches, it's the same thing. Are the stacks high or the stacks low? Are they come together or are they apart? How densely are the books stacked in there? Right? How many of you how many have ever worked into walked into a children's collection with eight foot high stacks? And you said, do you one only serve mutants here? <laughs> or two, do you really enjoy endangering the lives of children who are willing to climb? Right? That idea that we don't even think about it sometimes, but those are choices. That is the stewardship that we bring. Do we put but money in the budget for gasoline? That is a choice about whether we go outside of the space. Do we circulate whatever? We are stewards. All of this is owned by a community. But the community has given us special power, special authority, because of our expertise, because of our trustworthy nature, to do something with it. So that's the definition of a library. Does that mean that the stewards will buy books? Maybe. Does that mean that they will be quiet spaces for only quiet reflection reading? Maybe. Does it mean it will have 3D printers or robots? Maybe. There is no universal definition of librarians because what good stewards do is they work with their communities. And what does our community need? Does our community need quiet reflection? Does our community need active services? Does our community need the ability to go out into rural areas that may not have physical connections? There's no one answer. This is a very different way of looking at libraries, particularly public libraries, than we used to do them. For example, books. I would argue that that concept of libraries as books, or worse, the building full of books, is probably about a 70-year-old concept. If you look at libraries from the turn of the century, particularly large urban libraries, they were pretty barren places. One, because the books were so valuable, they were usually tucked away where no one could get to them, and they were closed stacks. But the other thing is, there just weren't that many of them. It wasn't until after World War II, when great industrialization had come to the country, that we realized that we could mass produce paper and ink and binding at a, such a reduced cost, that for the same cost that publishers used to publish two books hoping one would make money, they could publish six books with the hope that one would make money. And what happened is the number of titles being published shot through the roof, almost an exponential growth. And libraries that had policies that said, we need to buy everything from a given publisher, because once again, that was two books, suddenly didn't change, suddenly, didn't change that mission, and they were buying six and 10 and 12, and suddenly they ran out of room, and so it began pushing into common spaces, public spaces, learning spaces, and we started putting them around columns, and we started building higher shelves. And of course, libraries are about books, because God, look at them now. Now. What's the next nostalgia? What's the thing that the kids today, six and seven-year-olds, and by the way, no, I'm not going to that. Six and seven-year-olds, what's their nostalgia going to be? Mine, I, did, I taught duct tape, and making duct tape in a library. Mine is going to be that idea of saying, I was able to go and do Minecraft with other friends. I was on a Lego League in my library. That nostalgia is what we need to talk about, and it's perfectly consistent with our mission, with our values, with our means of facilitation. That's where this definition begins to come. All right. The buildings, books, databases, they're tools. They're like scalpels to a doctor. Essential and important, but changeable. So now let's do a little, we've been talking at you enough. All right, here's what I want you to do. Let me get, let's begin talking about how we can rethink our service. And here's what I'm, I'm going to ask a question, and then we're going to do some more. Here's the question. If someone brought in a stack of 12 books into your library, what would you do? Because they're your library books that you return them. Okay, so, good point. Someone brings in 12 books, they say, I'm cleaning out grandma's house. I found these 12. I'm sure you are. 
<laughs> By the way, I'm all for proposing legislation that National Geographic must make their print edition self destructive. <laughs> <laughs> Twelve years later, you pick up that book about Uganda and it's like, whoa, I guess I'm done. Right. Twelve books from Grandma. I'm sure you can use them. What do you do? Give them to Amy. Okay, Amy, what is Amy? <laughs> all right, Amy, what do you do? Um, um, First thing we do is we sort of okay. have to look at them and see whether or not they're age appropriate, age adjacent, or is something we will need here in the library. Okay. If they don't pass that test, what happens? They get, we have a consignment platform, we scan for them, and then they um, go in our book notes. Or if they do pass that test, what happens to them? If they pass the test and they meet those qualifications, I look at them, I look at the database to see which branch does not have it, which branch has it. If we have it here, we look to see if ours needs replaced, then we um, put it in the collection. Okay. Now, same patron brings me grandma. She's not dead. <laughs> <laughs> I've noticed there are certain members of the science that are very precise, so I want to be clear. <laughs> this is my grandma. She worked um, as an accountant in the railroad industry. I'm sorry, my history is not great. Yeah. Does that work? Sure. And she would like to share what she knows with the community. What do you do with her? You <laughs> towards a collection of materials, that makes perfect sense. When you orient yourself to learning and the community, suddenly you begin to see these interesting gaps. So what I want to do now is I want to walk us through a process where we begin to think about what if we don't just consider the materials the collection, but the community itself the collection. So to do that, I need you all to stand up and find a friend. Groups of two. Stand up. What we're going to talk about, and now I'm going to have you move again, so that's why I don't worry about where you are right now. This is a quote that I put out that lots of people like tweeting around, and either people love it or they hate it. Bad libraries build collections, good libraries build services, great libraries build communities. The full version of that that doesn't fit in 143 characters is bad libraries build collections, good libraries build services, of which collections are one, great libraries build communities. What we want to talk about now is the idea that it's not the size of your collection, but the reach of your community that matters. What we want to begin now talking about is how we can begin to look at our communities, not as problems, not as things that need to be solved. They need better literacy. They need a place to go. They need it. Not as deficits, but as assets and as aspirations and dreams. So, 
starting with us as a community. Question for you on our banana apple exercise. Did anyone find it hard to talk for two minutes about a topic? <laughs> why did you find it hard? Yes. So here's something to think about for a moment. What we're going to reach to, remember it said it's all about learning, books, learning, etc. Learning is by its very nature participatory. Even when you're reading a book, you're having this lovely conversation in your head about do I believe it, do I agree, does that make sense, what the hell, right? <laughs> At some point today, you probably want, what does he say? Who were you talking to? <laughs> Have you ever done one of these when you get up in the morning and you're like, well, let's see, I need coffee and I need a bagel. And I get coffee, no, I'll start with a bagel. I'll start with, ah, I should get the coffee bill, right? It's like you're having an argument to yourself. This is not a sense of psychosis, this is perfectly normal. When you're presented information, back to that idea of how this is set up, it is uncomfortable to not participate. You want to ask questions, you want to, at the very least, give social cues, like, that's very interesting, even if you're watching. <laughs> but did you have, but most of you said, but actually coming up with the two minutes of content, not a problem. Right? I mean, we've all either been or been inflicted on that guest at dinner that were like, but that's really interesting. Thank you. Again, really? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so one, learning and interacting, think about the interaction. But two, we all have passions that we have something to share. And when we're put the obligation to share, we'll do it. One of the things that many people talk about public service or community access, we talk about that, by the way, the technical services aspect of this in a moment. But there's, oh, you have to be an extrovert. I'm so tired of hearing that librarians are full of introverts. Because it really isn't this, you're not like stamped with one thing or another. There are places in your life that you are very reserved and you don't feel comfortable participating. But there are other places in your life that you're very engaged and passionate and want to share. So the first thing is to realize that our communities have this too. Just as we have passions that we care about and get us over that hump of actually talking to people, this happens throughout the community. So that's the other thing. So one, interactive. Two, the idea of passions and participation. So now what I want you to do, stand up again. We're going to start talking about how we take advantage of the passions that we find in our community by starting with the passions we have in this room. So what I need you to now do, you don't have to move, is I want you to like form a table. So find like five friends. Just even Okay. All right. Hold on. Ready? All right. So, what was your group talking about? What was it? Uh, tra travel. Travel. And what did you come up with? Okay. I'll get that one. Well, uh, one thing our, our travel experts have already done is go out to schools. Okay. Do a program there. Um, so that's that's one thing that she's done. We were suggesting a travel blog. Okay. All right. Great. Uh, what you guys? What, what what topic were you working on? Um, 
cooking, all right? What'd you come up with? Um, so I mentioned about the outreach. Um, I asked um, information science is all about their interest in going to and educating themselves that are not um, up to age on health. Um, health education as far as cooking. Okay. Um, you teach them the benefits of food for health matters, how to go about it. Okay. And also, um, great cooking classes or cooking workshops, but also promote these workshops by going to them more things about how to All right. So two things to notice about these two groups just to start with. One, talked a lot about community outreach, different programming. Now we're talking about community outreach and programming and literally outreaches and going out into the community, but also materials, materials development. Once again, I, as I, we're talking about this, what we're going to do in our minds is we're going to start doing something that is very unhealthy. We're going to try and map the idea of putting the community as a collection into our current way of thinking of technical services and public services and outreach services and such. The idea of having the community help us to develop what materials do we have, are they good, how can they be organized, how can we put materials together. When you're organizing or cataloging a document, for example, you're really doing a form of community outreach. When you're assigning, you know, classifying documents, assigning terms, etc., you're doing a sort of anticipatory reference in a degree. You're not trying to say, this is what this material is about. You're trying to say, these are the conversations or learning in which this material would be useful. Right? That's, in, in good old-fashioned classification 101, that's a major difference. The, the metadata, the cataloging data, does not emerge magically from the document. It is something, once again, that we impose upon the document. Is this about travel? Is this about cooking? What do you do with Eat, Pray, Love, which is about cooking and travel and self-actualization, and right? So that idea of how do we classify them is another one. What conversations are the community having? How can we match what their expectations are? It happens on the technical service side. How can we help them organize materials? So, great. Uh, what were you guys working on? You were cooking as well. All right. And cooking. And and we were, um, I guess we were kind of set up as, you know, a cooking professional coming into the library to um, maybe look through the cookbooks and see what um, the library may be missing and um, what, you know, we may want to add to the collection that way. And also thinking about, um, doing maybe like a cooking seminar mm -hmm. where you can bring, um, like as a cooking professional, I can bring a finished product in and I can bring folks in and let them sample the finished product, but show them how to get that um, finished product you know, from scratch. So hands on. Once again, what we're talking here about, if we go back to this group principle of learning, we can talk about, what I like between these two groups, it's very interesting. You're talking about the notion of how do you become a better cook, in essence. How, to, how a professional comes in, how you could make better food, teaching, etc. You talked about not only the notion of cooking, but how it linked to health, as an example. How can we talk about healthy eating and healthy cooking habits? And right, so it's not necessarily one or the other. We can talk about how these connect into different communities and different conversations. One of the things in the museum world, there's a lot of discussion about sort of how do museums, traditional art museums and such, for example serve the communities that they're within, above and beyond the sort of humanities concept of learning and appreciation. And one of the things they've come up, particularly in urban centers, is that they normally are in the middle of food deserts. They're the place that, you know, there's no real grocery store, there's no affordable access to produce, etc. And what they could do, literally, in their cafes, is they can provide nutritious food and they can provide it low cost and things of that nature. So the idea that, do you, does anyone, do we run cafes in any of the branches? Yeah. Maybe we do. <laughs> um, the story I have about that, I know, now I, was, I just saw a bunch of side eyes. <laughs> <laughs> so either that means we wanted one, or they'll ruin our books. Free Library of Philadelphia. Free Library of Philadelphia, the main branch, beautiful Beaux Arts building, right in the middle of downtown Philly. At 9 o'clock in the morning, Logan Park, which is right over the street, is full to the max. The minute those doors open, huge wave of population comes in. Turns out, a 
great big percentage of those are people who are homeless. This is the place that they can go in, they get restroom facilities, they have warmth, they have a place to live. It got to the point where this homeless community coming in was causing some issues with the restroom facilities. And in fact, one of their major donors who was there for a big author talk went to the bathroom afterwards, came out disgusted, and said, you must fix this. The librarians at the Free Library of Philadelphia put out a call to all their fellow urban libraries going, please help us with the homeless issue. Most of the responses they got back were things like vagrancy laws, how to get people out of the building. They even talked about the, if you've ever seen them, along the windowsills, putting nice little spikes to keep people from having a place to sit. Hmm? And so what the librarian said was, wait, we have a homelessness problem, but it's not that the homeless are coming to our libraries, it's that we have homeless, that we have this effort to improve our communities, we can't simply say that part of the population is not our problem. So what they did is they first hired several homeless to act as restroom attendants, which once again, I know sounds like, well, that's a pretty simple answer, but they gave them some jobs. The other thing they did is they put in a cafe. That cafe, which they got the Bank of America to do the major funding, Starbucks provided all the training and the equipment, local bakeries provided the produce and food so they weren't competition, and it was a homelessness to work uh, program that staffed people into that. So they not only gave them jobs, but they gave them ownership of the jobs and they gave them transition. They invited social services to come and set up in Logan Park so they could distribute materials and service and aid as well. That choice that they made was to see how they could improve the community and use the community to do it. It wasn't a matter of let's buy a good book on how to fix homelessness. It was the idea of working across the community to figure out those parts. So, anyway, uh, that's once again, a library is, does not have to be a reactive organization. They can be a proactive organization helping build a narrative, changing the narrative of the homeless problem to how do we empower our communities to improve. That's a narrative. And I know it sounds like words, but when we put actions behind it and programs behind it and bring partners into it, we begin to shape how people view our community. And what other agency? I mean, you can say, well, that's City Hall's job or what have you. But really, what other trusted agencies span all age groups, classes, and regions of this community to help build that narrative? That's something that we can do. So whether it's around cooking, whether it's around travel, travel to, travel from, etc. Great examples. Okay, up here, what would you guys come up with? Cooking, all right? Sorry. <laughs> What'd you guys want? We took it, as you actually said, the grandmother came in. Sure, okay. okay. So anyway, some of the things that we said that we could do was um, have an actual program where she comes in and she can talk about her recipes and talk about the history, how she, how, um, how she loves cooking. And then we said that we could um, record her and either you know, do it digitally, digitally like um, YouTube, or we could um, uh, put a recipe on our web page to, for outreach. We could interview her and, and uh, have a put the interview in our collection, and um, we could do um, just you know just like I said, just get her memories and everything, right. and so that. That we would have an actual history of it. Right. You can begin to build our narrative, our history, capture it, share it, distribute it. Right. One thing that we talk a lot about, for example, is self publishing. <coughs> um, the idea that a library can be a place where people can go and produce and publish and not simply consume and buy. You know, from online services that, from CreateSpace to you can get these lovely book machines, which are way too expensive and finicky, but that idea that we can be a place to distribute and share this as well as others. Back to the idea of connecting people. Here are my recipes, what are your recipes? Right? For example, as a, as a northerner moving to South Carolina and hearing over and over again about shrimp and grits, <laughs> I kind of assumed that meant grits, shrimp. And it does in some places. And in other places it means grits, shrimp, and fancy stuff. And you know, kind of like mac and cheese. There is no more. But hey, anyway, that idea of suddenly connecting community is putting it together. What did you guys come up with? Uh, you were cooking. How about back here? Oh, she had travel. Okay. Um, our idea was a, um, it, it, like an interactive online 
travel like website blog. Basically, um, four like residents of Florence, written by residents of Florence. Uh, people who've been out in the world, been traveling, they can write down their experiences, email them to you know an email address to the library. We'll go through, post the ones that maybe are most informative or interesting. We'll do like a country a month or something. We talk about major cities and maybe include um, links to you know travel like actual travel guides or. So one of the things to think about is you're not the only ones in in Florence that's worried about travel, right? So I'm sure South Carolina tourism office at the state level, et cetera. So one of these things is to think about how can we be a part? Back to that greedy librarian problem. Cooking is not just a problem of us, right? That there are there are other people that teach cooking programs, there's school nutrition programs, travel, there are people who travel, they're probably local travel agents. My wife happens to be a travel agent. You know, having a co-working space, having access where we can bring in people to talk about travel, all those are possibilities. Because what we're starting with is, remember, first of all, we are a community. We are a community linked around working for, with the library. Right? And now what we're talking about is begin to expand that through our experts, through showing the experts, through giving them some valuation of what they're doing, and to create partners. Because the best advocacy that we can do for librarians and libraries is, one, not done by us. It's done by those who we serve and help. Having them show up and talk about the important. And two is sustain. That idea that, for example, one time they come in and they leave. So let me take uh, cooking for a moment. So you're our chef, you're our expert chef. We're going to put on a cooking program. We're going to teach you how to make this wonderful cook. How would we normally put that program together? Back to sort of the process that we talked about. Well, if you wanted to have a demonstration, Take a restaurant and ask them if they would come to a program, and then you um, put out um, information uh, for the public about make flyers, put it on your website okay. about you know programs coming. Okay. So you would have to make sure that you have all the materials that you need to do what you need to do. No one shows up. First library program that's ever happened. <laughs> How do you feel if the accident? Nobody shows up. Nobody shows up. Well, Whose fault is it? Nobody shows up. If someone wa you never walk away from an empty room going. <laughs> I'm not even saying, I'm not talking about inflicting fault upon someone, but there's a perception of fault, right? What could we have done differently? Now, compare that. You know, the reason this is a greedy librarian problem, again, and I'm not accusing anyone of that. But if we take it as, oh, we have an expert, let's not bother them. We'll go do all the advertising, promotion, we'll get the materials, we'll tell us what we need. Don't worry, you're a busy person. When you show up, we're there. No one shows up. Who's the fault, right? Or who's perceived fault? On the other hand, if it's you're the cook, let's go. Do you have a community to talk to? Who should we advertise for? Who local? Can you talk to local chefs and get them in there? Now, if no one shows up, it's a shared responsibility. And then the answer becomes, well, why didn't you advertise better? Or whatever. It becomes, what could we do better next time? I'll give you an example. Eli Nyberger at the Ann Arbor District Library has people coming to him and going, oh, we have this great topic. We're going to a book group. And Eli sits there and goes, no. And he goes, no, no, you're a library, we do book groups. And Eli goes, we can do a book group if you want. No one will show up. No, no, we will. And he does, and no one shows up. And then he says, look, this is a reading community. They're all in 12 book clubs already. You're not going to be added to that list. Sharing the expertise and the connection and the network. That notion that, for example, in our community, we have people, right, we already, in four groups, have talked about two topics. For some of you, you didn't even necessarily know that was an interest that other people had. How can we begin to network them and connect them? And how do we bring reach out beyond what the library is being in mind? Another example. Library says, we believe that we want to be a musical community. Musicians are great. We want musicians. We're going to create a match service so that if you're a guitarist and you're looking for a drummer, we're going to put you in touch. We invite all these musicians and we're so thrilled. We have this great idea. We're going to use some of the musicians look at us and say, What are you nuts? Because we have that. They're called 
far. <laughs> that for country music and rock music and punk music and popular music, it was already happening. And the library doing this was not going to help. They said, but for classical music and world music, there's nothing. There's one venue we can use, which is the Philadelphia the Philharmonic, which costs a lot of money, no one's going to put on an unknown person. But if you gave us two grand pianos on the stage, if you gave us the ability to perform in your auditorium, oh, I bring my friends and my buddies, and suddenly I have value and I'm providing it. And so that idea of suddenly connecting to a community we didn't even know existed, it could lead to a whole different way of interacting with bring people together. Right. I want to just uh, thank you very much. I know we didn't get all there are shoes. Sure, we gotta get our shoes. How about you? We are a tree. <laughs> Now, let me ask a seemingly oddball question, but probably one that people instantly go, huh. For the shoe program, how many books are we going to circulate because people are bringing in shoes? Does it matter? All right, let me ask that again. Let me ask it of, I don't know, administrators. Does it matter? Okay. The reason I ask that question is twofold. One, it doesn't matter at a conceptual level. And I say that, but I've had a lot of librarians who sit there and they talk about the cooking class, and by God, there will be 12 cookbooks in the back of that room ready to be checked out instantly because that's really what we're here for. That all of these are what I call the pizza pizza book. Pizza Pizza Book is what we do in academic libraries. There aren't enough students are coming to the library. I know, let's feed them pizza. They come in. Pizza, pizza, pop! Because <laughs> <laughs> at, at the end of the day, what stack do we have to turn in? What's going to be evaluated? What's the budget per In other words, this is great, but shoes and social impact is wonderful. Cooking and cooking desert, and just cooking for fun and travel and connecting people. These are wonderful. But unless we can figure out how to truly capture his impact, then over time, what we're going to do is we're going to do wonderful things that we don't have a story to tell. But couldn't we get the money you could record like that? You can like, present the impact of giving shoes to the homeless. To who? To council or to the people who matter. You can record it. And show them. You know, yeah, we but may you not have, have the numbers in books, but look at what we're doing and look at the people in our community now. Amen, amen, amen. But you have to do that. And you have to realize that the statistics that that's an agreement. The state library, I imagine, requires certain data. Is it the right data? Is this, you know, my point of this is, and I know this is we're, we're at like the tip of the iceberg, blah blah blah. I don't want to give up the idea that. By the way, we need to figure out how to assess this, we need to figure out the story, and once again, we also have to figure out amongst ourselves that even if they never walk away with a book, it was still a successful program that, once again, we have to think broader because everything in this building and structure is going to scream to you about what really we're the materials business. And us trying to come up with, we have to bring our communities along with change in that too. And I'll tell you, telling community impact stories is lovely and wonderful, but it's hard compared to number of books taken out last month and looking at a graph over time. I mean, quality of life metrics are hard to come up with and really hard to demonstrate impact, but we need to do that. All right, so a couple of other thoughts and then I will get, get off. Before I do that, does anyone have a 
problem with the term expert in this context? Better yet, who are the experts? Who did I assign as the experts? Could you raise your hands briefly? What qualifies you as being an expert? Yeah. That's one. Two. You were cooking. Are you? Are you an expert? Because remember, I started this by asking what your passion was. And then I said, you'll be the expert. So I wanted to put that on. So, But that idea that some people have a passion for something, but they don't in any way declare that they know anything about it. And so what we have to be careful of is when someone expresses passion, how do we begin to connect that to expertise or whatever? Your other one, um, I, you know, how do we know they're an expert? This is why when I talk about your community is your collection, and I said before about technical services and public services. How many books do we have around us at this moment that we all feel a thousand percent comfortable to its accuracy, validity, and would share it as the prime example of knowledge in our community? We don't do that. We have policies, collection procedures, we have buyers, we have review systems, we have challenge plans. We have a whole schema built up to determine the validity of a resource. We need to think likewise about our experts, our community. So, I have a passion for cooking. I suck at it, but I have a passion for cooking. <laughs> Once again, maybe instead of saying, what you're going to do, do you know who someone is? What's your favorite restaurant? Maybe we connect. We had, I had a, a one library where someone came in and she was a, a preschool teacher. She had a passion for early literacy. And the first reaction was, great, we'll do a workshop, we get on stage, you can pay, teach people about she goes, I do that all day. No, thank you. I have no interest. So what they said, what she do? She came up with quick parental lesson plans with a board book and a toy. For example, one of the early literacy components is to associate words with physicality. And so motion, here's a, explains that, here's the lesson plan, here's the board book on motion, and here's one of those toys where you roll it out and it comes back kind of thing, so the kid can play. That turned into not only less parental lesson plans on early literacy, it turned into telescopes. So they would loan out telescopes, and once again, with materials and plans, they did oscilloscopes, they did electrical systems, they did all these things where, once again, my children's library, next year, two years, what these materials, we do a lot of direct programming, but if we ever decide to put them in circulation, how do we build sort of success models around circulation? That's where community might come in. There was a group in Illinois called the Robot Test Kitchen. There were four librarians on a continuum from if it's got a battery in it, I want to know, and I want to figure out how to work it, to if it has a battery in it, I don't want to hear about it when leaving. And <laughs> they were all used services librarians, and they would take a product. Here's, here's Spiro. Here's Makey Makey. And they would all try it, and they would all write up a blog that said, this is a great product for beginners and advanced. This one gave even the advanced person heartburn. Providing that context within the community back and forth. So think about that. All right. I just want to quickly sort of sum up a few things. Th I mentioned before the bristle bots. That's what they look like. That was at the Fayetteville Free Library. This is a picture of their maker space. And their maker space has this guy behind you is doing 3D printing. That's a 3D printer. You're seeing they're doing crafts here. What you don't see is about eight computerized sewing machines that are over in the corner. And by the way, if you ask the librarians, if that 3D printer breaks, they're there in a second. If that sewing machine clogs, they don't want anything to do with it. They're terrified of the sewing machines. Okay. So why are they there? Well, they're there because a community of sewers comes in and uses them and teaches them. And at one point, one of the, the people who did is like, I don't know why library you know, actively involved her. I don't know why library is sewing machines. The libraries don't know what to do with them. But that idea, that's right. You do. That idea that it sometimes takes a mental shift on our community. If we take them and bring them in, we have to say, you know what? That's right. This is about sharing your expertise, not just us knowing them. So that's part of the change. What's interesting is they began to feel, other folks began to feel left out. For example, their tweens and early kids said, we can't use this space. So they built what they called the little maker space. And so the little maker space is in the children's area, and this corner is curated by the kids. If they do a, a cool cardboard construction or a glue structure, whatever, they go and actually put it up and, and build it. 
They, instead of using the word customer or member or user or whatever, they call everyone who comes in the library a maker. Whether you're making ideas and thoughts or physical things. That a parent can come in, go to the 3D printer, print out their new design, take it over to the team space where they'll make a you know, Kickstarter video of it with their green screen and production facilities. And meanwhile, their younger kids are working in the maker space so that they'll be the next generation. And they sort of bring everyone into this concept. This came from, this is one of my favorites, this was a summer school, summer program, summer camp they put on, which was Geek Girls. And the idea is, many of us know, particularly in middle school, that girls coming through, you know, if you ask third grade boys and girls, are you going to go be a scientist someday, there's about an equal answer yes, we do. By middle school, unfortunately, it dramatically dropped off, and boys are much more likely than girls to say they're going to go into a science and technology field, and high school could be even more. So they wanted to put on a geek girl camp. But what they did was they went to their community and they said, who can teach some of this? And they found, for example, a couple that build trebuchets. It's like a catapult with a can wheel. And so at one point during, during, during the week-long camp, there were people walking through the stacks as things were flying over their heads. <laughs> they found another group that brought in a cement mixer full of, is it baking soda and water with the non-Newtonian fluid, which is if you press slowly, it's a fluid, but if you smack it, it's... It's a solid cornstarch, cornstarch and water. And so they built a track that people could run over and play in. And they found a female fighter pilot who came in to talk about what it was to be in the military and a mother and a woman in STEM, etc. Now, what's interesting about all that is they were all community members. They all lived in the service area of the library. And that meant after the camp was done, they were still in the community and connected and had that connection brought together. Where this came from was it came from a very simple little form. And I know you can't read it in the back, so I'll read it for you. It has three questions. Question number one, what do you love to do? Question number two, what are you passionate about? Now, this form gets handed out. If you borrow a Kindle, if you go to the 3D Makerspace, if you go to a program, you get this form. They said they got a lot of, what am I passionate about? Right? And I'm going to South Carolina, it could be even more interesting. But once they got over that, and then the third important question was, would you be interested in sharing what you know slash teaching it to your neighbors in the community? And the director would call them up and say, I can see you have a passion in. They had a Fifty Shades of Grey night. They did it in the Unos down the street because, you know, there were products available. And so, but that's interesting. They had the Fifty Shades of Grey night, and they had the Doctor Who night, and they had the Down Abbey night, and they had... And they were organized, they had liquor license, it was both. Organized by the community based on their interests. They had, this came out of their volunteer program. You guys have a volunteer program? Yes, you have volunteers, shelters, etc. Does it ever seem like it's more work than the work you get out of the volunteers? That's what they found in. They were so busy trying to turn them into little librarians that they couldn't do their regular job. And they realized, this is wrong. We're getting this 180 degrees wrong. We're taking doctors and lawyers and people with lifetime experience walking in here and saying, forget what you know, here's how to show. And what they realize is, no, no, no. You're a doctor. You're a lawyer. You're a janitor. You live here for whatever. That's what we want you to share. That's your volunteer. That's your effort. You're the collection, and you're going to share. That's where the 3D printer came from. That's where the sewing machine came from. That's where the mini maker space, not because someone thought of a grand dream, but because someone in the community said, I have a passion for that. Not I'm an expert. And one of the things that we, we do is oftentimes, I mean, here's a couple of examples that popped out of it. Sewing and knitting. They had someone come in and said, I love the Civil War. He was a uh, Home Depot warehouse worker. And he, they started with the, we'll put you on a stage and you can share stories of the Civil War, turned into sitting and had other people going, oh, well, would you got that wrong? And, the marcher, and it turned into a weekly discussion group where people were coming in and sharing and such. Community gardening. Group of people came into a library and said, we'd love to do gardening. Rather than let's go buy a gardening book, they looked around and said, we've got a lot of land. And a hose. Cost them a hose. And they built plots and they went to garden. And when, in August, we got way too many tomatoes, they began talking about local sourcing and food pantry. The Scouts came in. The Boy Scouts built raised beds. The Girl Scouts built a bug motel because they, taught, they studied how insects are important for pollination, etc. It's now the library barn. 
and they now have the library farmer's market once a month. And it's built on that interest of the community as they came in. Lego Robotics, Digital Video Production, Minecraft competition. They had a Minecraft competition. The kids came in the first one, they said, that sucked. You people know nothing about Minecraft. Once again, the librarian said, what do you do? And so from then on, these teenagers came in and they built the you know, Capture the Flag and, and Hunger Games versions. Gaming tournaments, these all came out of, it's a tiny library too, much smaller than, than Florence. But they were able to do it because they had the community to sustain and build it. So, given that I have a minute and a half left, this is all great, lovely. All right. Let me leave you with this. The future of this library in this community will not be built by engaging the community or reaching out to the community, but by the community directly. This is not something that we can say, oh, we have a community outreach. And why I love throwing everything on you when it's a donation, it's all of our jobs. It's, and it's all our jobs whether we have the MLS after our name or whether we don't even have a high school degree after our name, whether we're a volunteer, whether we're a paraprofessional. Because we all have passion. We all live in this community, we're part of the community, we speak to the community. What is the narrative of your community? Is it the halfway point between New York and Miami where I get drugs near a railroad station? <laughs> or is it we're in a growing area near the strand? Or is it we are a place of literature? Or is it a place of what is that narrative? How can we help stitch together the narratives of people in disparate pockets and populations? How can we bring that together so that Florence Public Library is truly the narrative creator and generator out of our community? The future of a community is better defined by its aspirations than its deficiencies. We have problems in all of our communities. We have problems in education. We have problems with race. We have problems with literacy. We have problems with employment. We have problems within our environment. We have problems in our government and politicians. Right? If we want to spend today just having a moment where we all go, <laughs> our communities are faced with the same problems, and they are going to stop. If all we do, out of our drive to help, out of being service-oriented and trying to improve our communities, if all we do is point out what's wrong with our communities, they will stop listening to us. They will stop coming to us. If on the other hand we go, what do we want to be today and tomorrow? What do we aspire to? Then when we talk about low literacy rates, we don't say, because you can't read. We say, you need to read because that's where we're going. When you talk about cooking and food, this is a local cuisine that's going to be lost, turns into, if we can capture the local expertise and history of this place, a story. The possibilities are where we want to head. So concentrate and focus on what are the aspirations, because ultimately the community is the collection that we build. And if you want to, if, if you want to refer to them or have them refer to you as customers, fine. I like neighbors. I like members. But the point is not the words, the point is how we treat them. If all we worry about is serving them, think about this. When someone walks up to a desk, reference desk, information desk, what do we have? How can I help you? And we see that as sort of pinnacle and greatest expression of service that we have in our profession. We see that as an invitation. We see that as our truest best self. But realize that that same phrase can be seen as one of the most arrogant statements that we can make. How can I help you? Because clearly I can provide assistance and you need assistance. How can I help you means you are in trouble? On the other hand, if someone came up and goes, What are you passionate about today? What are you working on? How can I be part of what you're doing? We see this on the reference desk all the time. When someone comes up and asks us a question, the dumbest question we can ask back is, well, have you searched Google? Well, yes. <laughs> Do I agree? <laughs> right? We know not to ask that question. We know that most of the time when people come up to ask us questions, they know more about the topic than we do. So let's embrace that. How can I learn with you today? How can I be part of that? I don't care how we phrase it, but that's the attitude. It's not about customer service and they walk away happy. 
It's so that we all walk away better. And that's a partnership and an intimate relationship that goes beyond simply those who are in the building and out of the building, but a constant way of thinking about what we do. We need to expect more out of our libraries, and we need our communities to break through the nostalgia so they too expect more of us. And that leads to greater support and greater opportunity, which leads to greater communities, which leads to a better country. That's what this is all about. Thank you very much for your time. I think I'm right there, so I appreciate it.